thank you for letting me come up here and share. <laughs> and even though I'm a flatlander, uh, so I take that with great humility being up here. <laughs> so we're, uh, watching that video gets me fired up. I have a question for you, though. Uh, because God has called his followers to be change agents, to be world changers. I believe that's what you guys have been talking about these last few weeks as a series, is being world changers. Uh, so today I want you to think about choosing to love where God places you. Uh, but I want to ask you a question first. Is God sending you somewhere? Is God sending you somewhere? Well, raise your hand if God is sending you somewhere. Okay, so raise your hand if you're a follower of Jesus, and then raise your hand if God is sending you somewhere. <laughs> so to be a follower of Jesus means God is sending us. God is sending us somewhere. God is sending us to someone. To follow Jesus means to be sent, to go. Now, being a sender is rooted in the very nature of God himself. God is by his nature a sender. So sentness is this characteristic that often seems lost. Uh, yet God sends prophets, God sends angels, and mommies, and neighbors, and soccer teammates, and co-workers, even homeless, to demonstrate and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, the news that is good for all of us, for each and every person. So God is a sender by nature. Now, if you want to know how far God will go to send and to empathize with us and meet us where we are at, then just look at Jesus. God went so far as to send his very own son to enter in human form, to be a human, Jesus. John 20, 21 says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus identifies himself as being sent over 40 times in the Gospel of John. So the Father sends Jesus, and, the Fa and Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. God sends the Holy Spirit, and the church, followers of Jesus, also are sent. Now, God, where does God send us? Where does God send Jesus? See, God sent Jesus into the neighborhood, and Jesus sends us into the neighborhood. Check out the message's uh, interpretation of John 1.14. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. I love this. God is in your hood. God is in the mountain here, in, on the mountaintop here. He's come to your block. He's on your turf. He's not an outsider. He's moved in. Jesus is your neighbor. He's become one of us. What an example to follow. Je see, Jesus knows what it's like. Those neighbors that throw those loud parties every weekend, the rental house, don't get me started, the, the house that's being broken into, the couple that fights so loud that you regularly hear them yelling, those suspicious-looking young people that always walk around your neighborhood. And in the same way, as the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus sends us into the neighborhood, into our spheres of influence, into, a, a biblical word for this is oikos, into our households, the people that are our closest, 8 to 15 people that God has strategically placed in our lives, that we could show them God's love, that they could experience hope in relationship with us. And guess what? God sends all classes of people. God sends mothers-in-law, yeah, you heard it, Naomi with Ruth. God sends retired prostitutes, Rahab. God sends people who've committed fraud, Zacchaeus. He sends murderers, Moses. God sends leaders of the Jewish mafia, the Apostle Paul. He sends donkeys. So if someone's ever called you a donkey, he can still send you. As he sent to Balaam in Numbers 22, he even sends left-handed people. There is hope for you left-handed people. And that's Ehud in Judges 3. So we all have people in our neighborhood, in our spheres of influence, maybe in our families. 
in our households, in our oikos, that God wants to move and do something in them, provide hope and healing and a future. And he wants to move through us. And he wants to provide hope and healing and a future in us through those who are closest to us. A few years ago, uh, when we respond to Jesus sending us, we are like my friend Steve. Uh, as a young boy, Steve's dad, who was a police officer, was murdered in the line of duty, uh, which forever altered Steve's life. About 40 years later, uh, God continues to redeem that terrible pl- pain that Steve went through and, and has shaped his whole life. God is turning this terrible pain when his dad was murdered in the line of duty as an opportunity to move into a young boy's neighborhood. A boy like Steve who lost his dad in the line of duty as a cop. I don't know if you remember the Christopher uh, Dorner shootings and and manhunt a couple years ago. Uh, Well, this young boy, Ian's dad, was the Riverside officer who was murdered. And uh, and Ian is someone that our community has, has grown close to because Steve and his wife, Steve, has been a, a police officer for 30, 40 years and, and has recently retired. But as he has leveraged this pain that he went through as a kid, who would have thought that 40 years later he would be a minister to a boy who went through just the same thing as him? And, and God wants to bless and heal and move through us so that we can be a blessing to others, even through our hurt, even through our pain. Steve Steve brings them, Ian and his mom, to barbecues with their small group. Steve took Ian to the batting cages one day and showed him how to hit a baseball. Uh, Steve, though, he didn't think he was doing much of anything doing this. He said, you know, I'm not doing anything significant for God. I think, Steve, yes, you are. Ian tells him at the end of the day, he had so much fun that he didn't want to go home. He says, Steve, what are we doing next? See, Steve is building into this young man, showing him God's love, blessing him that Ian could experience the blessing of God. So does that count? Does that count as church? Does that count as following God? You bet. And I think it's time that the church here in America understands what truly counts. Paul says there's only one thing that counts. Know what it is? Galatians 5. Faith expressing itself in love. And what was Steve doing? How did Steve move into Ian's neighborhood? Faith, trusting God, expressing itself in love. Amen, right? Now, we don't continue to do something because we've always done it that way, or because it worked 20 years ago, or because we're most comfortable doing life that way. Or doing church that way. We also don't do something just because it's cool or the latest trend or it's made some other church, this mega church. But we filter every decision through the grid of whether it's aligned and most effectively helps us participate in God's mission. God's mission to bless, to show others his radical love, to bless our neighborhoods, to bless our neighbors, to bless our worlds. We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus to demonstrate and proclaim the love of God. Luke 4, 43 says, But Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Jesus was sent to proclaim that there is good news, that there is hope. And so we follow Jesus to proclaim and to demonstrate that there is good news no matter what situation you are in. Now, I want us to go back to the beginning of the Bible, and I want us to look at, at a man who was called, who was sent, who was called to go. And I have, have a second question for us. How do we love where God places us? How do we follow Jesus into the neighborhood? You see, from the beginning, God's way of reaching and restoring the world has always been through a blessing strategy. So let's go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 3 here. God is first sending Abram, who will become the father of many nations, including the people of Israel. In Genesis 12, 1 to 3, it says this. uh, 
Start off with verse 1, and then 2 and 3 are up there. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Life was good for Abram. Life was comfortable. He was comfortable where he was at. He was comfortable with his household. Then God calls Abram to go, to live an adventure, to go to this unknown place, to go to a people that he doesn't know what they're going to like, to go to a place that is different. And God calls him to go, to leave his home, to step out of his comfort zone and to walk across the street to walk across the world even. And as a result, God will not only bless him, but he will bless all peoples on earth through Abram and whoever anyone, anyone who curses him, God will also curse. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal, doesn't it? I mean, if someone curses you, wouldn't it be kind of nice for God to curse them? I mean, if someone, if you... God wants to bless you. Wouldn't that be amazing to say, God, to speak to you, I want to bless you. And through you, you're going to bless the world. That is pretty awesome. Now, wouldn't you think out of this, Abram would be pretty bold as he's going? It might be uncomfortable stepping out of his comfort zone, but as he's going and he's facing situations on the journey, don't you think that he would be bold in how he's living? It's amazing to see what happens next, shortly after this. Abram and his wife, Sarai, and their people, their family, their clan, are are traveling, going toward what will be the promised land. And there's a famine. So hardship comes, there's a famine, they've got to figure out how to get food. And they, they are starving. And so they end up going toward Egypt, and as they go to Egypt, they go and see Pharaoh. And now, Sarai, Abram's wife, she is a foxy lady. She is hot to trot. And Pharaoh sees, sees this lady, and he says, Wow, I want her to be my wife. So Abram, who, remember, has just been given this blessing, blessed to be a blessing, and anyone who curses you, I will curse, seemingly has forgotten this, because what does Abram do? He says, Oh, no. My wife let Pharaoh have her because I don't want to be killed. I don't want to suffer. It is about me, and so I would rather say, yep, she's my sister. Women, how would you like that if your significant other, the next gathering where you go with strangers, introduces you, yeah, she's my sister, right? Not going to go over well. And yet Abram, out of fear for his own life, out of trying to take control of a situation, and instead of relying on God but doing it in his own strength, instead of that, what does Abram do? He says, she's my sister. And it ends up Pharaoh and his people are cursed, and and they actually suffer uh, because of this. And then Pharaoh says, what have you done, Abram? What were you thinking? And ends up giving, giving his wife back, Sarai, back. And then Abram goes on. And see, there's times when God has called us to be a blessing, where we shrink back, where we're afraid. We try to take control of our own situations. I just want to encourage you. If that is you, if you've done that, that is okay, because God can still redeem that. And it's, it's just time for us to say, then, God, I've messed up. I'm sorry. I've tried to take control of my own situation. And I want to rely on you to be a blessing. Now, Abram, this promise is through him. So this promise to be a blessing is through Abram. And how it is is because the coming Messiah, a thousand of years later, will be, through, will be through Abram's seed, which is then Jesus the Messiah. Now, uh, this study, see, as we are called the bless, there is a study about blessers versus converters. The study was performed on two missionary teams that were going to Thailand. Both had two very different strategies. One team's strategy was to go to Thailand and focus on blessing people there. They would learn the culture and find ways to serve and bless people in tangible ways. They were the blessers. 
The other team's strategy was to go and focus on getting converts. Their plan was to get as many converts as people. They were known as the converters. Do you know what the results of the study were after five years? The, the, study, the study was found, found that uh, the blessers had resulted in greater social impact in their community, greater good for their community, uh, but not their commuter, not the converters. And surprisingly, the blessers accomplished 48 times as many conversions as the converter team. So for every one conversion that the converters experienced, the blessers had 48. I think the best way to help people find their way back to God is when we love them and we bless them with no strings attached. It is only then that they develop an interest in why we are doing it. So let me ask you, can you bless today? Can you bless someone today in your sphere of influence? Someone, wherever you go out of the building today, can you be a blessing? I've uh, provided a, a blessing a strategy bookmark in your, in your, uh, in your notes. And, uh, and if you want to pull, pull out in the bulletins there, uh, there's a blessing strategy. And this is a simple tool to help us think about how do we be a blessing to others. It is a blessing strategy. Uh, you see, God called Abraham to be a blessing, and God, called, God sent Jesus to be a blessing, and Jesus sends us to be a blessing. You see this throughout the New Testament. Just uh, one verse I'll highlight is Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, Jesus says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify the fa your Father in heaven. Be around people and let them see you blessing others. Let you be a blessing to them with the purpose that they glorify God, not you. And so as you look at that tool, uh, here's a simple way to do that, that, that we have been practicing as a community. I and my, my community is you begin with prayer. God, how do you want me to bless the people in the places you've sent me? And then you listen. You don't talk, but listen to people. Listen to their struggles, their pains, and the places that God sent you. Your father is already at work in, in your spheres of influence, in your neighborhoods, with your household, with your family. And so you listen. And then you eat. You eat. You can't just check this off. It's not quick, but you have to have a meal with people or a cup of coffee. It builds relationships. And then you serve. If you listen with people and you eat with people, they will tell you how to love them, and you'll know how to serve them. And then S, share your story. When the time is right, now we talk and we share, hey, this is something God's been doing in my life. You know, I've been struggling here, and yet God helped me with this. And you share the story of how Jesus has been changing your life. And we all have not just one story, but many stories of how God moves and has been moving and changing our lives. We have many testimonies of the ways that God has worked when we have a relationship with God. I, a few years ago, as I, God started to stir my heart to say, I don't want to just go to church. I don't want to just meet God in a building. And I, I want to meet God but I want to make a difference in this world. I want to leave an impact. God started to stir in me this thing where I didn't just say I loved people who were different than me or far from God, but he really helped it become concrete where, where I practically, tangibly loved people who, who I didn't know, but who became then my friends and my community. People who had different beliefs or maybe were a different religious background or looked different than me, ate different food than me, and to love them. And what there is nothing more gratifying now than I find than loving someone who doesn't have the hope in Jesus that I have and wanting them to help and have that hope. As, as me and some of my friends have been on this journey, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the friends that God placed in our lives was end up being uh, one of my roommates that I rent a room to in my house, uh, Justin. And Justin is, uh, was, uh, when he moved in at the time, he uh, called himself a Christian, but uh, wasn't, wasn't real living for God, was uh, dating a Jewish girlfriend, and hadn't really been involved in, in church, or had an active relationship with God since maybe a young kid. And as Justin uh, 
moves in, I tell everyone, every person who moves in, you know, I have a Bible study that meets here on Monday nights. Just want to let you know to warn you <laughs> in case that's uncomfortable for you. Like, you don't have to come, but I just want to know if there's an invitation, but also we have this. And as Justin started to live with me after a year or so, he started to hang out with my friends. Like, oh, these are cool people. And, uh, and still didn't really have a relationship with God, but, but started to hang out with my friends. And one of my friends then invited him to a birthday party. It was a murder mystery dinner birthday party. And as he, he goes to this, he has a blast. And he says, you know, I wasn't sure about how cool Tim was, but these people, they're really cool. <laughs> and, and he says, you know, I like hanging out with them. Well, a few months later, him and his girlfriend uh, break up. And a month after that, he asked me, you know, Tim, uh, you gave me a year or so ago that invitation to come to that Bible study. Can, can I still come? And inside, I'm like jumping up and down. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm playing it cool. Of course. And so he, he ends up coming to the Bible study, and God just does this awesome work in his life. He ends up getting, then a couple weeks later, I was speaking in church, so he hears that. He said, hey, I want to come hear you in church. So he comes, and then every week from then on out, he starts to get involved in our Christian community. Not only does he come to church, but then when we throw parties, when we go and bless others, he comes and does it too. And, he, and we discover that he has this, this deep, deep passion, this niche, where if someone has a problem, he will spend hours upon hours trying to fix it. So if he finds out that a friend has a car problem, he will do all this research and just kind of be his own auto mechanic. And try and figure out how to fix a car. So Justin has realized, wow, God can use me to be a blessing to others. And Justin gave his life to Jesus and is a follower of Jesus now. Blessed to be a blessing. And Justin has caught this vision to bless others. What, what if we lived like that? That we could look at the people around us, and with no strings attached, we could say, you know, this kind of list of B-L-E-S-S, uh, what if I started today? What if I, and then tomorrow. God, who, who do you want me to bless? Who can I be a blessing to? And it's not complicated. It's that neighbor across the way and saying, you know, I don't know their name. Next time I see them, I'm going to wave. I'm like, hey, this is awkward. I should know your name, but I don't. My name's Tim. What's your name? And you start a conversation. Hey, how, how, are, you go, how are you doing? How do you like living up here on the mountaintop? And then that builds the next time you see them. Hey, how's your week been going? And then maybe you and your wife, you, you invite them over. Hey, you know, we have some good dinner. Well, would you like to come over this week and, and, and get some bite to eat with us and just have a meal? And you just have a meal together. And you build a relationship. So you start to cultivate a friendship. And you find that God starts to burden your heart for this person, this neighbor. And you start to love them and you start to care about what they're going through, they start to share with you their problems. It's like my neighbor Justin and Star, who have two kids, don't live together. Star lives there uh, with her kids across the street. And there's one small group we were praying, and I said, you know, I just want to pray for my neighbors across the street. Not more than uh, 10 minutes later, Justin, the boyfriend, they've been together for about eight years, comes and knocks on the front door. What? <laughs> and he says, and he says, you know, uh, hey, can you, can, do you have a part to, uh, do you have a tool? I think it was an Allen wrench or something, because I, because I don't have this tool, and we've got, got something broke in there. I think, it, actually I actually think it was a toilet broken, and so he's asking for a tool for, to help fix it. He said, yeah, let me go get it. So simple thing, right? And that took nothing to go get a tool. Well, this relationship continues to build. I see him across the street. We'll talk with him. Uh, ends up, ends up within six months later, they're talking about marriage and ask me, you know, Tim, uh, we, we saw your backyard. We it had invited people over for barbecue. I did a b neighborhood barbecue, and a bunch of neighbors came over. Uh, they had met us. I originally met them at Halloween where we hand out coffee on our driveways to people who trick-or-treat. My neighborhood at least, at least gets a lot of trick-or-treaters. And so try to be a blessing in that simple way. See, there's lots of simple ways to be a blessing. It doesn't have to be daunting or intimidating. And so Justin and Star, they have asked me to marry them. 
And they even want me to, they even were, and I don't think they actually are going to do this, but uh, I thought it was crazy. They even wanted to get married in my backyard. <laughs> I'm like, okay, if you want it, sure. <laughs> And, and then a couple weeks ago, uh, around Easter time, they, uh, they have started going to a church, and they invited me to their church. So God is moving in their lives. And, and it started with a hello, and then meeting them at, at Trick or Treat and Halloween, and then helping them, help them move a fridge one time, and then gave them a tool, and praying for them. And then they're asking me to marry them, and then they're inviting me to church. So God is moving in their life, and, and, it's, and it's through. God is moving even before we engage in their lives and other people's lives. But he wants, to, he wants to give us hope and give us this joy of being a blessing to others, and he wants to give others that hope as well. So the, the invitation for you, and the question, where is God sending you? Where is God sending you? Because God's sending you to your neighborhood. God's sending you to your coworkers. God is sending us to our community right here on the mountaintop. God is sending us to the person at the grocery store who's in line in front of us, to the, to the worker, the cashier there. God is sending us to those in our sphere of influence, those all around us. And he's sending us to be a blessing. As simple as beginning in prayer, listening, eating, we all can eat, right? So eating with someone else, serving and sharing your story. So will you be a blessing? Will you follow in the way of Jesus, follow in the way of Abram, that God has called us, that we are blessed to be a blessing? As, as, I, uh, as I wrap up, one, um, one last uh, person that, uh, that God, has got, God has moved in our lives is, uh, is the name uh, Kajal, is my, our friend Kajal. And, Ka- and I share these stories to help you see a picture that it's simple stuff. Blessed to be a blessing. Kajal is a friend who lived in an apartment complex with a couple of my other friends and was a UCR student. Uh, she's from India and uh, has a Hindu background. And over a couple of years, started to build a relationship with her, invited her to barbecues we would do, and invited her, ended up over a number of, uh, after we knew her for over a year, even invited her to some of the church activities we did. Uh, but over, after two years of knowing her, uh, Kajal, we have become her primary community, her primary group of friends. And it ends up, they're all Christians that are around her. <laughs> Just happens to be because she's now a part of all of our group of friends. Even though she's not a follower of Jesus, she's not a Christian, and after two years, she's graduated from her master's program, is needing to find a job. If not, she has to go home to India. It is, she has about two weeks where if she doesn't get a job and then is able to have a, the, the company give her a work visa, she'll be back to India and is just kind of messing up her whole plans. So she is super stressed and can't sleep, is worried about all this. Kajal is, goes up on our friend's Molly and says, Molly, will you pray for me? And the reason why she says, she says, Molly, pray for me because your God listens. Because your God listens. Don't we want to have those experiences? Don't, want, don't we want people who are in our spheres of influence to find that hope where they, in their deepest pain, in their, in their highest moment of stress, they look to us because we've had that friendship with them. And we can point them to Jesus, who is, the, who is the author and creator of our hope, who gives us all that we need to sustain whatever ups and downs we go through in life. So what if this community, what if everyone here said today, starting today, I am blessed to be a blessing. And as I go, I am going to be a blessing to others. I'm going to begin with prayer, I'm going to listen, I'm going to eat, I'm going to serve, and I'm going to share my story. What if you and your small groups, as a, as a community, said, you know, hey, let's throw a neighborhood barbecue. Let's, let's, just in, let's do a barbecue, have some fun together, invite some of our other friends that we know. And you don't do anything churchy, you just hang out with people. You just do life normal. You don't even need to pray at the meal. 
you just get together. Because I believe as we br- and our friends bridge our Christian community with our unchurched community, that God's spirit is moving. And people will be drawn to the God that is living inside of us, that is living inside of this church. Oh, would that not be awesome to see this mountain transform, to see people that are in darkness, people that are in addiction, people that are struggling with finances, people who have broken marriages. Would that not be awesome that because we have positioned ourselves in the lives of those who are far from him by blessing them, by blessing them in these simple ways, that they would find healing, that marriages would be restored, that addictions would be overcome, that people who want to give up on life would say, not today, I'm going to keep on going because God has given me a hope and this community, this friendship has forever changed my life. May we be those people who are a hope to the world. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the ways that you move. Even when we sometimes are like Abram and we try to take control and we do it our own way, and we say, God, you know, I don't, I don't really trust you. God, we, we repent and we're sorry for those moments when we don't trust you. We're so concerned we can't see how to overcome the situation that we're in, that we try to take things in our own hands. And we forget the people all around of us who are broken, who are hurting. God, I thank you that even when we are broken and hurting, you want to bless us. And especially then you want to bless us and bless us to be a blessing. I pray that you would stir something in this community. The work that you've been doing here in Crestline First Baptist, that you would continue to expand our capacity to dream your dreams to enlarge in our vision, to be a blessing to those all around us. That you would do something radical and amazing on this mountaintop that no one could deny that you are God and that you are good and that you can overcome no matter what darkness we face. Thank you, God. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.